Happy Mother's Day to the mothers. This is a, a special day because uh, we're all born of our mothers and the opportunity to thank them. Um, I did that for many years, but my mother is now enjoying heaven, as is my wife's mother. <clears throat> At my last church, we used to uh, give out prizes to mothers. Um, one was kind of delicate, uh, give a prize to the oldest mother. You had to be careful with that one. But we had, uh, we had one couple in the church, and when it came to the most kids that you had, I just walked over and gave it to her uh, because they had 13. And yes, it was on purpose. That would have been the plan. When they got married, they were going to have 13, and they had 13. Uh, one set of twins. Um, godly couple. Always enjoyed them. And wow, 13 kids. That's a lot. Uh, that's a lot of kids, that it is. Uh, but it was a joy. Uh, do we have something for the... Okay, uh, ladies, there is a gift for you after service. Uh, That's for all ladies. All ladies, yes, whoever you are. Yes, we will give each lady a gift, so we appreciate that. Uh, guys are not mothers. I don't care what politics says. So, guys, you, you do not get one. Your time is next month, not this month. So... Uh, the story is told, a wife, when she fixed the roast for dinner, that she would always cut the ends off of the roast before she put it in the pan. There was plenty of room, but she always cut off the ends of the roast. And one day her husband asked her, honey, why do you cut off the ends of the roast? I mean, there's, there's plenty of room in there. So what's the purpose in cutting off the road, the ends? And she said, well, my mom always cut off the ends of the roast. So, uh, so I just cut off the ends of the roast. I wonder why she did that. So they called her mom and said, Mom, I always cut off the ends of the roast because you always cut off the ends of the roast. How come you cut the ends of the roast off of off of it before you put it in the pan. And she says, well, my mom always cut off the ends of the roast. <laughs> and so I always cut off the ends of the roast. I don't know why, because there's plenty of room in my pan. So they called Grandma and said, Grandma, why did you cut off the ends of the roast before you put it in the pan? And she says, well, honey, my pan's too small. To, for my rose to fit in. So I have to cut off the ends. Oh. One of the greatest influences we have, which continues from the time that we're born all of our lives, is the influence of our mothers. I can still think of the things, some of the things that my mother used to say to me. And invariably, I've said them to my kids. In fact, I've heard my kids say them to their kids. It's kind of a snicker. It's like, yeah, I remember. I remember that. Don't let anyone tell you that the influence of a mother isn't that great. That, that you need to get out and do something else to, to really count in life. Can you really count in life by being a mother in the influence that you have? Mothers really do make a difference in the lives of their kids and in the things of the world. And in thinking about that, I started thinking of some of the mothers in Scripture and the influence that they had on their kids. But not only that, the influence that that has on us because of the things that they did as mothers. And that's what I want to look at this morning, is some of the mothers of Scripture 
and the things that they did and how that influences us. Because we have to remember that we influence the next generation, especially mothers influence their kids. And how mothers influence their kids makes a big difference in how the generations go. It's important. Mothers, you are important. You're very important. Not that fathers aren't important, but this is Mother's Day. So we're going to talk to mothers. Guys, you can listen in, and you can take heed and learn too, but this is for mothers. So we want to look and see what Scripture says about mothers and their influence on their children. Several mothers are here, and we are going to look at them. But we're going to start with prayer, and then we'll dig in. Lord, we are thankful for being here this morning. We're thankful for the opportunity to sing and praise our God. But now we want to focus for a bit on mothers and what you've said about them in Scripture and the influence that they've had. So teach us, Lord. Help us to be reminded of the influence that you give through mothers. And it's designed by you. And we want to see that as we look in Scripture today. In Jesus' name, amen. (coughs) So the first mother I want to talk about, or to look at in Scripture, is actually a mother and a grandmother. Okay, and that's in 2 Timothy chapter 1. And and Paul remarks to Timothy in verse 5, 2 Timothy 1, 5, about his mother and his grandmother. And he says... I am reminded of your sincere faith. Timothy, your genuine faith. A faith that dwells first in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and now, I am sure, dwells in you as well. What is he saying there? He's saying that grandma influenced mom to Christ. Mom influenced Timothy for Christ. And Timothy was who? Paul's protege. He was a pastor in Ephesus. He, he was a man of God that Paul, in, in First and Second Timothy, writing the instructions to him, says, Timothy, you're a young man, but God has called you into ministry, and I want you to stand firm in the faith. So because of his grandmother and his mother, we have uh, two letters that Paul wrote. And and in in, in the book of Acts, it talks about him in in the fact that he was an influential minister for the gospel. And we benefit from that because of who he is. We cannot let our children choose for themselves if i let my kids choose for themselves my let let my grandkids choose for themselves they would not choose well and in fact sometimes grandpa opens his mouth and gets into trouble because i remind them of what scripture says grandpa why do you always have to say that because it's the truth and because i want you to choose to do right Don't let your kids choose unless they choose godly things. Teach them to choose godly things. I've heard people say, well, I want them to choose, you know, for themselves and have the freedom to choose. No, don't let them do it. They'll choose ice cream for breakfast every morning, won't they? Of course they will. I would too, but my wife says I can't do that. There's no such thing as a neutral kid. We aren't neutral. Our kids are rotten little sinners. And they need Jesus Christ. And we have to tell them about Jesus. And we have to teach them the right and the wrong, the godly things to do. They don't automatically do what's godly. 
I don't always automatically do what's godly. I have to work at it. And I had to teach my children, and I teach my grandchildren, and my great-grandchildren. I want them to choose godly. But if they're going to choose godly, they've got to have influence. And Lois, grandma, and Eunice, mom, taught Timothy what was right. That is important. And God put that in Scripture for us, reminding us moms, you need to be godly. You need to influence your kids for godliness. You need to harp on them when they need harped on. There were times when my mother would harp on me, my dad too, but my mom would harp on me about things that I was choosing to do that I shouldn't be choosing to do. And I, le- I listened to her. And I'm sure that's where Timothy is too. He, he learned from mom and grandma. God says in Deuteronomy chapter 6, these words I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. Not haphazardly, diligently to your children. And shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand. We as, as parents are to teach our children consistently God's word. We are to we are to teach them and live before them godliness. They need it. Look around you, and you can see the inconsistency in our society and the damage that it does. It does all the time. And it's like, oh, well, you don't want to damage their little egos. Yes, I do. I want to twist that ego toward Christ and not toward the world and sin, which is where it's headed, unless I twist it in the right direction. God tells me to teach it to them diligently. In other words, when I see them going this way, turn them the other way. No, this is the way you should go. If I see them run into the street, I'm I'm not going to say, oh, you know, sweetheart, you really shouldn't do that because that truck coming down the street is going to hit you. I'm going to scream, am I not? Spiritually, they're headed for disaster unless we teach him. And that's what Lois and Eunice did with grandson and son Timothy. And we received a good benefit because of it. There's no greater heritage than having our children come to faith in Christ. It's a joy. And to watch them faithfully live for the Lord. I got a couple grandsons that I harp on once in a while because they're not living faithfully as they should. And I want them to turn and go the right way. And know their mom does too. And their grandma does does too. Instruct your kids. Passing the faith along. It says in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verses uh, 14 and 15, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and have from your childhood uh, been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Timothy, the goal of grandma and mom was godliness holiness in you through faith in Jesus Christ and that goal was accomplished what a blessing it's exciting when I talk to my kids and hear what's going on in church I want to know what's going on in church and what they're doing Uh, I'm excited about that and about my grandkids as well because that's the most important thing in life is faith in Christ and faithfulness to Christ. There's nothing more important in life. Money is nice, but it's not lasting. Uncle Sam, make sure of that, right? 
but make God's word a priority in your life and pass it along to them. Joshua chapter 8 and verse 35 speaks of, of a time when they were reading uh, the public reading of scripture and it, it noted that even in, infants were there listening to the word. And it's like, well, they don't even understand that much. Yes, but it's an impression that starts in infancy. infancy and we can, we can work all the way up in their lives uh, with scripture. Scripture is important for them for the needy. Uh, they need to know it. And Timothy was saved as a youngster, and God's word was present in him from that time on. I'm glad I was brought up in church. I, I think it's a privilege to have been brought up in church. Uh, every Sunday, I, I don't ever remember a time when I didn't go to church. My mom took me to church from the time I was an infant, and I am so thankful for that. Not everybody has that privilege, but my mom did. Um, and then my dad was saved when I was uh, about five or six years old. And so I was raised in a Christian home. It's a blessing. It's a joy to be raised in a Christian home. What a privilege. Make sure your kids hear it and see it in you. It is a privilege for them. Whether they whine about it or not, now, my kids didn't whine about going to church every Sunday because they knew they'd get in trouble if they did. But I think they enjoyed it. You know, did they ever whine? I, I don't ever remember them whining. I don't remember whining about it. Um, it's just something that you teach your kids to do. The, the joy of, of being in church and, and worshiping the Lord and singing and hearing His Word. Uh, enjoy it and, and teach them the joy of it. That's important. Uh, and that, that's a heritage that we can see from Timothy through his grandmother and mother. The next one I want to look at is Jochebed. Ever heard of Jochebed? Well, you have. You just may not remember about it. But <clears throat> Jochebed was Moses' mother. So clear back in the book of Exodus, it says... Now a man from the house of Levi went and took a wife of the house of Levi. A woman conce uh, the woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him three months. And when she could hide him no longer, she took, him and took for him a basket made of bulrushes and daubed it with uh, pitch, and she put the child in it and placed it among the reeds of the bank of the river. And his sister stood at a distance to know what would be done to him. Now the daughter of Pharaoh came to bathe at the river while, she, um, while, her, while her young woman walked along the river bank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her servant to get it. When she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby was crying. She took pity on him. And said, this is one of the Hebrews' children. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call a nurse for you from the Hebrew women? And she said, Yes, go. And the girl went and called the child's mother. That, that's the story of, of uh, Moses. Now, why did she hide him for three months? What, what is going on here? What's going on here is Pharaoh said, Look, uh, you're, you're getting too many kids and you're going so... Uh, too fast, so so I want you to let all the girls live, but if it's a may, uh, male baby, I want you to throw him in the river. That was Egypt's answer to abortion. Okay, I want you to kill your male children. Now, Jacobed said, no. I'm not going to do it. That's evil before the Lord. And she resisted, and she hid her baby. She and her family chose God's way over any other way. No, that's murder. I'm not going to do it. Children are not a convenience. 
Children are a blessing from the Lord, it says in Psalm 117. I enjoy my children most of the time. There was once in a while, it's like, why did we have this kid, you know? <laughs> but would I have traded them in, you know? No, I would not have. And the opportunity to mold them into godly people, that's a joy. Enjoy your kids. Boy, they grow up fast. And now I have grandkids. Boy, they grow up fast. And now I have great-grandkids. I enjoy my kids, my grandkids, my great-grandkids. And Jochebed said, no way, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to murder my son. And so she devised a plan whereby even if he was raised in Pharaoh's house, he's still alive. But she had him. And what did she do with him while he was a boy? She had the opportunity. It says in Hebrews chapter 11, By faith Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's edict. Now, was Moses an unusually beautiful baby? All babies are beautiful, right? Uh, you could go look after service if you want to and, and see. Uh, Noah and Loris got the newest one, you know? And, and just the enjoyment of babies. It's a joy to see them. And, and this couple said, no, we're not going to. We're going to do what God wants us to do and, and raise this this child for the king, for God. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking for the reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king, <clears throat> for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and sprinkled the blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch them. Moses was raised in Pharaoh's house after a while, but his parents faithfully taught him while they had him. And the influence that they had <clears throat> on Moses never left him. And God got a hold of him and used him in a great manner. I mean, who has not heard of Moses? What did Moses write of Scripture? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And he wrote some of the Psalms as well. Moses was a mighty man of God because his parents said, I don't care what the government says. I'm raising my son, I'm keeping my son, and I'm going to see that he, he knows God before they can snatch him away from me. And God orchestrated this. Now, now, is all of this just the parents and not God? Of course not. But God used mothers in a godly fashion to influence the whole world, us, for Christ. Timothy, Moses, it's interesting. <clears throat> Mom passed her faith down to her kids so that the world would be blessed. Moses, his older brother Aaron, and older sister Miriam. The parents influenced for God their children. Okay. That's doing it the right way, but I wanted to throw in one that's the wrong way. Just to remind us. Rebecca. Isaac and Rebecca. It says in Genesis 27, 6 and 7, Rebecca said to her son Jacob, I heard your father speak to your brother Esau. Bring me some game and prepare for prepare for me delicious food so that I may eat and bless you before, uh, before the Lord before I die. 
Perhaps my father will see me and, and he will say uh, that I'm mocking him and bring a curse upon myself and not a blessing. And his mother said, let your curse be upon me, my son. Only obey my voice and go bring them to me. Son, I want you to uh, go get uh, a couple kids from the flock and uh, I, I'm going to prepare them so that you can deceive your father. Mom, that's not right. Son, just shut your mouth and go do what I tell you to do. Jacob learned deception from his mother. Now, kids can be deceivers without their mother's help. But in this case, Jacob learned deception, even though he was a, a, an adult by this time. But he learned deception from his mother. We can teach what is right. We can teach what is wrong. Not only by what we say, but by what we do. Jacob learned deception. And I would assume that he saw this all of his life growing up. And it seemed to be the norm for him and for Rebecca. After he left and took a wife from Rebecca's family, she never saw him again. Because she died while he was gone. Ouch. Jacob also learned deception from his uncle, that Uncle Laban, that is Rebecca's brother. He was a deceiver as well. So were they taught by their mom and dad? I would kind of think so. And, and Jacob, before it was all over, he learned to hate deception because he had it in his own family as well we can pass along godliness or we can pass along wickedness there are a few things in my kids that i would like to change because i can see me in them and some of the things i really like to see in them there's a few things it's like can we go back and redo this because I don't want to see this in you. I've struggled with this, and this is sin. And so um, I am thankful that God can get a hold of them and use them for his glory anyway. So there's Lois and Eunice. There is... Jacobed. There's Rebecca. The next one is Naomi in the book of Ruth. And, you know, Ruth is only four chapters long. And, and there is so much richness in this little book. Uh, the progression of faith after severe trial is just very interesting. And, and I'm fascinated with Naomi. Be fun to talk to her when we get to heaven. Ask her a few questions. But Naomi and her husband and two sons moved to Moab because there was a famine in Israel in Bethlehem. And <clears throat> while they were in Moab, the sons were adult sons, and, and the sons married. So they had Naomi and her husband, a son and his wife, and a son and his wife. And it says that out of this richness of, of family that Naomi was enjoying, it says that her husband died. And she was left with her two sons and their wives. But then both of the sons died. And it was Naomi and her two daughters-in-law. And, and that's, in biblical times, that was a disaster because you didn't have welfare to help with them 
And so it was hard for her. Not only, not only the economics, but, but the loss of your husband and your kids. That had to be very, very hard on her. <coughs> so Naomi is going to go back home. And in Ruth chapter 1, verses 15, 16, and 17, she says, See, uh, she's going back home, and uh, her daughters-in-law are going to go with her. And she says, Nah, you, you ought to stay here and try and find husbands. Because I, I'm just going to be in poverty when I get back. So uh, you might as well stay here. And so one daughter-in-law goes back to her home and to find a husband and, and to live uh, hopefully ha happily ever after. And, and uh, Ruth says, no, she's not going to. Naomi says to her, see, your, your, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. <coughs> Ruth said, do not urge me to leave you or return from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. She's choosing poverty. Your people shall be my people, your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord do so to me and more, if anything but death parts you, me from you. Naomi went out full. She's going back home empty. Naomi's faith is weak. Look what God has done to me. Girls, just, just leave me. Just, just go away. I'm not worth anything anymore. God, God's not going to do anything with me. Just go on home. But Ruth had recognized from Naomi... that all is with God, no matter what. Whether she had her husband, or her father-in-law, or her brother-in-law, or whatever, it's about God. Life is about God. And Ruth said, Mom, I'm not leaving. I don't care what goes on, I'm sticking with you. I'm not going back to my false gods. I have seen who the Lord is, and I am staying. Ruth realized that life without God was far worse than life without a husband. She'd rather be a widow the rest of her life than to be without God. She learned the tremendous value of God in her life from her mother-in-law. And I'm thinking, wow, in all the hardship that's going on, she still saw the value of God in life. And she said, that's where I'm sticking. Say, so Naomi must have been a significant testimony in her life. When the family was there and in widowhood, uh, I don't know, Naomi seems so distraught, and yet Ruth says, it doesn't matter, God is the value. Mom, don't you, don't you realize the value that we have in God? It's, it's not about us, it's about Him, and about who He is. So she realized life without God was far worse than anything else that could possibly happen. So they go back to Bethlehem and they're living there a very meager existence. And Naomi says to Ruth, My daughter, should I not seek rest for you that it may be well with you? They had gone back and Ruth had gone out and had gleaned in a field. And it just so happened that the field that she was gleaning in was a relative of theirs. 
And she, Naomi began to realize, wait a minute, God is still working here. I'm not going to give up. And my daughter-in-law has helped me see who God is and what he does. I should remember that. <coughs> so, so she's gleaning, and she brings it home, and Naomi says, this is a kinsman redeemer. This is somebody that can help us out under the law, under the law of Moses. So Naomi says to Ruth, <coughs> my daughter, will, will I not seek rest for you that it may be well with you? Is not Boaz our relative with whose these young women you were? See, he is winnowing barley tonight on the threshing floor. Wash, therefore, and anoint yourself and put on your cloak and go down to the threshing floor. Do not make yourself known to the man until he is finished eating and drinking. But when he lies down, observe the place where he lies. <coughs> then go <coughs> and uncover his feet. Lie down and he will tell you what to do. And she replied, are you out of your ever-loving mind? Mom, that's embarrassing. What does she say? All that you say... I will do. Ruth's faith started in her mother-in-law, but she trusted God. She learned to trust God from her mother-in-law, and she found the value of obedience to be above everything else. Now, I don't know if she understood the custom of the day. It sounds kind of crazy to me. You know, you go down to the threshing floor and you, you lay at the foot of this guy and, and then you just wait. Okay, God, what are we going to do here? This is kind of a scary situation to be in. You know, I think I can trust this guy and I know I can trust you. What are you going to do? <clears throat> Fascinating. She recognized God's hand moving on their behalf and acted accordingly. Trust brings blessings. Maybe not always happy endings like there was here. Because Boaz married Ruth, and they had a child, and the blessing that Ruth had is, may he be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher in your old age. That's what they're saying to Naomi, for your daughter-in-law who loves you, is more to you than seven sons has given birth to the grandpa of David. If, if Ruth would have said, ah, forget it, I'm going back, we wouldn't have had David. Now God would have would worked it out, but it's, it's because of the obedience of a mother-in-law and a daughter-in-law that we are blessed with King David. What a blessing. Our lives make a difference. Our faith makes a difference. And the way that we obey makes a great difference. Here it is in Naomi and Ruth. One last story. And that's the story of Hannah. <clears throat> Hannah is a wife, one of two wives, in the book of First Samuel, right in the time of the judges. And Hannah is loved by her husband, but she doesn't have any kids. But the other wife has several. And you know what that means means rivalry. And it means goading. <laughs> hey, Hannah, God's blessed me with children. You don't have any. You want to borrow one of mine? Can you just imagine all the things that are going on? Why has God not given Hannah any children? So 
So Hannah goes before the Lord at the tabernacle when they're visiting there, and she prays, and she asks the Lord for a child. And as she's praying, the high priest, Eli, thinks that, well, her lips are moving, but she's not saying anything. She must be drunk as a skunk. And so he rebukes her, and she says, No, my Lord, I am a woman of troubled spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Mom, have you ever poured your soul out before the Lord for your kids? I pray for my kids often. They need it. My mom prayed for me often. I still need it. Pray for your kids. Kids need our prayers. Samuel wasn't even born yet, and Hannah was praying for him. In due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Samuel, for she said, I have asked for him from the Lord. God answers prayer. And in this case, the woman who had been barren, God enables her to have a child, and she gives him a son. She was a woman of great prayer. Her desire to commune with God was passed on to her son because Samuel was a great prophet, a very godly man. And, and Hannah gave him to the Lord to serve the Lord from the time he was a little tiny tot. He was small, and yet through his mother's influence, he was a godly man, grew up to be a godly man, because Eli was not a really, the high priest was not really that good of an influence on him. But he learned to be a man who listened to God, to communion, commune with God from his mother. Because I, I look at his mother's prayer, I look at her mother, his mother's heart, and, and her, her dedication, and she learned and taught Samuel that, even at a young age. Now, he served in the temple. She would go up periodically to uh, see him, but she gave him to the Lord. That must have been tough. But she loved her son, and she loved her God. You remember the story of young Samuel when he's in the temple, and God calls to him, and he thinks it's Eli, so he runs in and uh, says, uh, Yes, sir, what did you want? I heard you call me. And Eli says, I didn't call you. So he goes back and lays down. And, and it happens three times. And, and finally, Eli says, wait a minute. I know what's going on. I, I know his mother. I know her godliness. And, and I know what she's taught Samuel. <coughs> Samuel is in tune with God. And, and so when God spoke to him, he heard his voice because he listened. When we listen to God and act accordingly, God acts through us. When we teach that to our children, they take notice of it. I remember times as a Bible college student. I went to Bible college after I had a wife and three kids. Did it the hard way. Um, but there were times when we did not have enough money to pay the bills. Not only then, <clears throat> but while pastoring. Uh, there were times when there was not enough money. And 
I said to the kids several times, God's called us, God will provide. Now, I didn't always know how he did, because there were times that at the beginning of the month, I knew the bills were coming, and I knew that there was not enough income coming in to meet those bills, and every month they were paid. And it's like, God provides. My children learned because I trusted God and passed it on to them. That's what happened with Samuel. Samuel learned to listen to God. Teach your kids to listen to God. To, to obey what God says. And, and to t when, when you do that, they will take notice. Now, not all of mine are doing it, but they know the stories. They know that if they trust God, he will provide. I've told them that. And sometimes they are, Grandpa. You know, it's like, don't all Grandpa me. It's all God. Be awed by him and who he is. Trust in God. Obeying God. It's catching. Pass it along. Our kids need it. Our church needs it. Our, our nation needs it. Our world needs it. Moms, pass your faith along to your children. That's the best thing you can give to them. Father, thank you for moms. Thank you for the examples that you have given us in Scripture because we need to remember, we need to realize the awesome responsibility and privilege you've given to moms. So we pray that you would bless them today. Encourage them, strengthen them, remind them that they are doing it for you. And to bless you as well as their children. Thank you, Father, for your word. In Jesus' name, amen.